So I'll tell you about our work uh, on trying to understand human genome as a molecule that's actually folded in 3D and argue that that's a very data rich field. Um, if I figure out how to use this remote, that's going to be incredibly helpful. Uh, I press, I'm, oh yeah. Okay, uh, good. <laughs> Somebody over there should press something else because I, okay. Okay, cool. Uh, no. Wrong presentation. Okay. Uh, in, a, in a different presentation. Okay. Okay, the guys, guys got lost. In Keynote, there is another presentation. It's, it's a data science to find. I think I'll have to run back. No, just another presentation. Go to Windows. Okay, good. Nice. Okay, let's see how this works. Okay, it works. Cool. Um, so, uh, DNA. Uh, you know that your genome is made of DNA. And so the, the traditional structure that you know from textbooks, so the Watson and Crick model, this is only 12 bases of DNA. Human genome is actually three billion bases. And the question is, we know how 12 bases look like, and, but we would love to know how three billion bases uh, of DNA look like in space. Again, we used to think about genome, especially in computer science, as a, as a text. So genome, we used to think about it as a one-dimensional object, kind of every letter here is a base of DNA. Uh, again, in reality, it's actually a molecule, but sort of uh, we, when we represent this as a text, so you can go, this is a very nice exhibit in the Welcome Collection in London, you can go and browse your chromosomes, and go and read chromosomes. So this is actually sort of, these are, this are volumes of the human reference human genome being printed at font five. So this just gives an idea about the information content of the human genome. Uh, in reality, human genome can, is a molecule, actually 46 molecules, they're called chromosomes. Uh, total lengths, oops, uh, how do I go back? Red one, okay, good. Um, total lengths of, 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 of these 46 molecules are two meters, and two meters are contained within every single <coughs> cell that has a nucleus. Uh, the question is how two meters are packed inside 10 microns. So that's the biological question. So an interesting actually side note is that the density of the information inside a, a, a nucleus is about one megabase per cubic micron. So if you were to scale this to one cubic centimeter, not really scale, but if, if you, for example, fill cubic centimeters with, with nuclei of, of cells, this gives you exactly an exabyte in one cubic centimeter. So it, basically in a memory stick. Uh, just an idea about exabytes, in 2013, Google had only 10 exabytes. In principle, this can be stored in this, that much amount of, of DNA packed. Um, and not only packed densely, but the, the mystery is that DNA is packed inside nuclei in such a way that it can be read, repackaged, and so on. So it's a very, it's, it's, DNA is totally accessible at this state. Uh, which brings me to the second point. So during the cell cycle, there are two stages of the cell cycle. Interface, that's where DNA is unpacked. And these are drawings from, the first drawings of chromosomes from 1860s by Walter Fleming. So, so this is interface, this is metaphase. So during metaphase, chromosomes are compacted. So that's how we knew about them, how they look like in the, in the 1860s. Uh, these days, so this is, this is high resolution microscopy. You can paint individual chromosomes in different colors. So, this is like, uh, so that's how interphase looks like. Chromosomes are unpacked. Um, and that's how metaphase looks like. So chromosomes are densely packed. And this is uh, 150 years after Walter Fleming. Um, Nevertheless, again, imaging provides us nice, colorful, uh, kind of coarse-grained pictures of chromosomes, but doesn't really provide information of how chromosomes are folded. So generally, kind of, you can just, just a kind of, a, for you to get an idea. So this is basically how chromosomes are folded during interphase, and that's how they should be folded during metaphase. They should be very tightly packed. And in fact, you need two copies of this because this goes to two daughter cells. So the question is, how is the fiber of DNA folded inside chromosomes and inside the whole nucleus. Um, a method that really changed this whole field completely uh, is the method called chromosome confirmation capture, historically called 3C, CCC, so 3C, and then there is an incarnation of this method called 4C and 5C, and the pinnacle of this is high C. Um, 
So the method hi c, again, developed by Job Decker while he was a postdoc with Nancy Kleckner at Harvard, and then developed here at MIT uh, jointly with, with, again, Job Decker, who is at UMass Medical Center in Worcester in 2009. Uh, the idea of the method is that you take, you take cells, uh, and two pieces of chromatin, two pieces of DNA might be closed in space, though they might be coming, for example, from different regions of the genome. You glue everything to everything with formaldehyde, uh, isolate these pieces and chop them by an enzyme, and then connect these two pieces together into a hybrid, uh, hybrid piece of DNA. So essentially, two regions of DNA that were very far apart happen to be close in space in one of the cells, and now they're glued together into a hybrid product. And you can read this hybrid, hybrid products by pair end sequencing. Basically, read, read this DNA. And then you can map this little blue piece to where it maps on the, on the chromosome, and the brown piece where this maps on the chromosome. And when you do this for one read, you update a table. So this is a table of counts. You update a table of counts here, increase one count. You say these two regions are in contact. So the genome will be represented as a table of contacts, which regions are in contact with which. In, uh, in the population of cells. A good experiment gives you about 10 billion such reads, enough to fill a map of 10 to the 7 by 10 to the 7. So that's a map of the whole human genome. Again, a three, 2D representation of the 3D structure, essentially a map of, of uh, uh, contacts in space. Uh, the dynamic range of this method, again, so here I show a color map, but no color can actually capture this because this is six orders of magnitude in intensity. So this, uh, this is a fantastic method, and I'll just show you how it looks like in the recently developed HiC browser developed by Peter Gellenborg, uh, Niels Gellenborg and P Peter Karpediev at Harvard. So this is a browser for this data, uh, which is actually better and faster than, than Google Maps. Uh, and it's better because you can see several views at the same time. I can browse, for example, a map on the left, and I can browse HiC data on the right. Um, and this is, this is a relatively low-resolution low movie. So I'm zooming into high C data. And at the same time, in scale, I'm zooming into, into a, a Google map. And it zooms into, into Harvard Medical School, because they're at Harvard Medical School. So again, this is the map of the, sorry. On the, on the right is the, you see individual chromosomes. And so you, I keep zooming in. So if the whole human genome is the, if the scale of, of Earth, we have here resolution of individual streets. So it's, it's comparable to, to, to uh, Google Maps. Now the question is, so uh, what kind of high C data do we have now? So we have this data for a variety of organisms from bacteria and yeast to mouse and human, plants, insects, and so on. This maps look strikingly different in different organisms, which reflects different organization of the genome and space. Um, so what are the main features in this maps? So if, I, if you just look at this map, it's a very high contrast projector that you have. So you see the checkerboards. And so these checkerboards are totally reproducible and reflect a compartmentalization of the genome. Um, but the question is, so when I have these maps and when I can I detect all these features, what do I want from this data? Uh, uh, kind of um, ultimately, I would love to get some sort of three-dimensional representation of the genome. But I know that the genome doesn't have a fixed structure. It's different in different moments in time, and it, it looks different in different, uh, in different cells. So this should be an ensemble of structures. And that's where kind of our, our approach of statistical physics comes in. What we basically would love to do, we would love to take this map and uh, from the map compute an ensemble of structures. But that's a hard inference problem, and we don't know how to solve it. Moreover, I'm not sure the problem is solvable a priori, that this data is sufficient to reproduce this ensemble. If I knew the ensemble, I could easily compute a map. So we're, we're going to try to solve the hard problem, but we can only solve the easy one. So basically what we're going to do, we're going to do trial and error approach. So the approach is that I will start with just a model, a computer model of a strain of DNA uh, coated with, with proteins as, as, as they are in, in nature. I will impose some additional interactions on this, on this uh, string of DNA, and then I will, let, I will simulate, essentially, Newton's laws uh, in, of, in, of, of dynamics. And so that's going to be my molecular dynamic simulations, where I would let this uh, chain of DNA jiggle and wiggle in space according to the interactions imposed. And that would create me an ensemble of structures. Again, I, I'm not using any data to do this. 
So I start with a biological hypothesis of how these things might be folded. I will generate this ensemble of structures. Uh, I will simulate a high C experiment, compute a simulated high C map, and then I will compare the simulated high C map with the real one, and then I will see whether I can or cannot reproduce certain features observed in real maps in my simulations. So it's a physics-based data analysis, if you wish. So we're not really learning from the data. We're starting with a hypothesis and seeing whether the hypothesis can reproduce what we observe in the data. Um, so it's a little bit of kind of uh, inverse, inverse uh, uh, inference. Um, so what, can we, what, what did we learn? So first of all, the main features of the data, uh, as I told you, there is a checkerboard. And this checkerboard reflects essentially separation of active and inactive regions of the genome in space. If, if you zoom into these maps, you see this block diagonal structure, uh, essentially domains uh, of, of genome where there are more interactions within each domain and few interactions between domains. So, so that's why you have this kind of isolation between domains. And they, they're called topological association domains. Uh, and that's, there is not much topological about them. That's just a typical abuse of a mathematical term in biology. Uh, we kind of got used to this already. Um, and, and, and so if you zoom in further, you see this kind of corner peaks. You see some, some of this uh, kind of finer structures uh, inside domains. So these are the main features of high C maps seen in, in, human, in the human genome. Uh, and the question is, what's the, physical, what's the physical realization of that? What kind of process can give rise to this checkerboard, so this, to these domains? And we particularly focused on domains a few years ago. Um, primarily because of their biological role. So what, what became apparent from this 2015 paper is that once some of the boundaries of domains are deleted, either naturally, a person would be losing this region, uh, or by mutations in mice, I can delete this particular region of the genome. What happens is that uh, domains start merging with each other, and that leads to lots of malformation, to, to various de developmental disorders and defects. So, and the question is, how can these domains, how, how are these domains maintained in, in the cell? How, how can you insulate this region of the genome from the neighboring region of the genome? Um, and to answer, so I'll take you straight to the answer. And the answer was really surprising. We tried lots of physical models of genome folding, and they totally did not reproduce this kind of pattern. We tried all sorts of equilibrium and non-equilibrium models, and they didn't work. And this continued until we made a, a wild hypothesis. We said, what if there is kind of, what if there is a motor that folds the genome? So it's not the interactions, but a, an, an actual molecular motor that lands on the genome and starts progressively in larger loop. And so this process was already hypothesized in the literature as a pro called loop extrusion process. Uh, such motor is, was not known and to an extent is not completely known now. Uh, so that was a hypothesis, that what if there is such a motor? Uh, so such motor would land on a, on a moving piece of DNA and would progressively enlarge such loop. And what we found is that if we simulate a system of many such motors with boundary elements, with elements that they cannot pass through, essentially kind of red lights, then at the end of this, we can get structures that look strikingly like domains in high C, like these domains of the human genome. So we said, okay, so that's an interesting process. So it can reproduce these domains. What else can, can such motors do? Um, and it turned out that they can also solve another problem. And the problem of, that I already mentioned, the problem of compacting chromosomes when you go from the interface to metaphase. So you basically need a motor. And I'll just show you simulations where there are two chromosomes, red and blue, mixed originally in the interface. And the only process that's happening now is that I simulate this individual motors landing on, on either red or blue piece and extruding loops. And by virtue of extruding loops, they essentially compactify each of the chromosome. Um, and the chromosomes repel each other because they're bulky. Uh, and they start, they start forming this extended compacted structures. You see, so basically what, what, what we observe here is segregation of two, of two chromosomes compaction segregation. And all you need is, is this motor process. Again, this motor process is completely hypothetical, or was at least, until, until very recently. Um, so we also, uh, in collaboration with Job Decker, and uh, we looked also at the high C data now as a function of time. So back to the data. So you can get high C data as a function of time 
during, during cell division. So this is uh, interface. You see all the structures that I mentioned, all these block diagonals and some of the checkerboards. This is time zero. You go into mitosis, and that's how the nucleus looks like. You go into mitosis, 2.5 minutes, not much had changed. Five minutes, some of the structures are lost. Chromosomes become more condensed. Seven minutes, you start seeing chromosomes in imaging, and you lose practically all the structures. 10 minutes, all the structures are gone completely. Chromosomes become nice and condensed. Uh, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, you have very condensed chromosomes, and you get this very interesting structure. You get essentially a second band. And what we showed is that the second band reflects spiral organization of chromosomes. And I'll just show you a movie that summarizes this work because we realized that to reach out to the, to, uh, to reach out to the uh, younger audience, you need to do YouTube videos. Uh, so, so that's a YouTube video of a chromosome. So that's, that's, that's our model of a chromosome. And we'll, we'll exp that reproduces high C data. So that's our modeling approach. And what we explain is that you need to have loops that are, that are stabilized or formed by what's called condensing two molecule. Uh, and the basis of condensing two molecules are forming a spiral. So again, you need this spiral to reproduce high C data. Uh, and we estimated from the modeling, we tried different values of the diameter and the step of the spiral. And we found those that, again, reproduce the data. As I told you, again, it's a trial and error approach. And there are many loops that essentially are forming like, follow like a steps of a staircase. And each loop is actually further compacted by smaller, into smaller loops. Each big loop is split into smaller loops, stabilized by this blue condensing ones. And again, we tested this by making various mutations, removing the blue ones, removing the red ones. I'll spare you all the details. Uh, so that's the final structure. Essentially, it's a spiral scaffold of the chromosome and then decorated by loops and overall very compact structure. That's what you need to reproduce the data. Again, we start with the data, but we're not modeling this based on the data. We're modeling this a priori and then trying to find parameters, physical parameters of, this, of such structures that would reproduce, that would reproduce the data. We don't, we don't need sound. It's OK. Uh, uh, okay, so that's, but the central thing for this is to need, we need a motor. And so we hypothesized that there is such a motor, but it remained a hypothesis until uh, about a couple of months ago. Uh, when, and people were quite skeptical that there is a motor that can, can, can compact DNA by loop extrusion. And sort of a couple of months ago, a paper from Case Decker's lab, no relation to Job Decker, just a common Dutch name. Uh, a uh, group of, of Case Decker from, from Delft demonstrated in single molecule experiments that if you take a piece of DNA, and that's a piece of DNA attached to the glass, and you add some of these condensing molecules that we suspected are um, loop extruders, uh, and add a flow of water, such a flow of buffer, such that this piece of DNA is, is stretched, so now the, the, the flow is on, you'll see a, a molecule landing here and progressively creating a loop. And a simulation on the right will just illustrate what's going on. This, uh, this is really simulations, but they just show what's, what's consistent again with this picture. So that's this loop that has been created by a condensing that also basically uh, took all the DNA from this side and kind of pushed it into a loop. So that's, that's just an illustration of what's happening in this single molecule experiment. So that was the ultimate demonstration that these molecules are indeed motors and they can extrude loops. Uh, and for us, uh, that, that's, that was an important moment because everything that we hypothesized before seems to be now supported by, by single molecule experiments. Just to summarize what I told you, high C data provide this unprecedented view at the folding of the human genome. View at the scale basically of, of, of uh, maps, of Google Maps, with the resolution that we now can go down basically, now we can do better than this movie, roughly go to the size of a single house. Uh, on scale of, of, of the planet, and then that uh, physical modeling is a way of understanding data. So it's not only feature detection, but it's, it's actually a way to explain how some of the, pro how these patterns have been shaped by a physical process. And so again, what we learned in particular from this data is that it's a non-equilibrium physical system, active system, where uh, uh, loop extrusion plays, plays a central role. So that's, that's the summary, and the people who, oops, that's interesting. Uh, uh, I hope it's not a bad 
a sign that one of the students is missing. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's, no? That's strange, okay. Uh, anyway, so, so these are, are fantastic students from, from, from my group. Uh, Carolyn Liu, she's a senior at MIT. She started working on loop extrusion in my lab when nobody wanted to do this because it was a side project. He wa she, was a, she was a high school student who came to MIT through MIT Outreach Prime, uh, Primes program and started working on this and got the first results and that was the moment where a graduate student said, oh, that's interesting, uh, and started working on this. Uh, uh, where indeed, we indeed, uh, with Job Decker, we co-direct the Center of Instruction Physics of the Genome and these are fantastic collaborators from all over the world that we are privileged to work with and thank you. Ah, it's a great question. Uh, people have been discussing that maybe you need a motor to compact the chromosome. And for chromosome compaction, there were ideas that you may have this loop enlargement process. Uh, but it wasn't so, even people who proposed this were kind of skeptical, say, oh, but nobody has seen this motor. So basically, the intuition came from uh, knowing that there are many molecular motors that operate in the cytoplasm that make our muscles contract and cells crawl, um, and basically are responsible for all the mechanical properties of, 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 uh, in life. So we said, why wouldn't there be another one in the, in the nucleus? Uh, and so we tried, we tried lots of things in simulations until we found we came across that. So it was kind of coincidental in, in, in some respect. Um, and we also kind of were bold enough to push the idea that that's a motor. Uh, and it seems to be, yeah, now confirmed. Yeah. Can you discuss how such a motor might have evolved ah. pre-life? Uh, it's a great question. In fact, what I did not mention is that such motors, or at least proteins of this class, are present in all forms of life, from bacteria and archaea to single cell eukaryotes to multicellular eukaryotes. Uh, and they, in bacteria, they seem to have a function of aligning to, chromo, to parts of a chromosome. Chromosome is a circle in bacteria, and the two arms of the circle are kind of aligned, juxtaposed like that, and that's the function of this protein in bacteria. That was already known that, sort of, for example, if you remove this particular protein, they kind of become misaligned. Uh, how, the, how this particular process came about, we don't know, because it exists very, very early. It's one of the fund, it seems to be one of the fundamental process uh, underlying genome organization. Uh, what we do see is that it may have changed dramatically at the moment when organisms became multicellular. Uh, because at that moment, what, what emerged at that moment are stop signs. Motors were present before, but they were not regulated. They were just compacting. Um, and at the moment when we're only starting to understand this now, again, sort of in, in one of these collaborations. So they did high C again data for very early metazoans, early multicellular organisms. And it looks like very early ones already have these motors, but do not have stop signs that regulate them and allow creating this genomic regions, genomic domains that are so important for development. So that seems to be uh, a kind of multicellular invention. One last quick question. Do you expect a similar process in mitochondrial DNA? Ah, uh, great question, actually. Mitochondrial DNA is incredibly small. It's only 16 kilobases. Uh, I don't know, actually, how they're segregated. It's a very, very good question. We should, we should think about this. Mitochondrial segregation is a very complicated process. And generally, bacteria do need such motors, but there is one in mitochondria I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. Let's thank the speaker again.